Anyways, oh, great to be in Hatford tonight and excited to, I didn't come across it. I thought the thing was still closed. That new bridge down here should make quite a difference, I guess, and get it done. No, I, I'm, it was dark, so I couldn't really tell. Does it slope up like the old one? Has to. Yeah, because it's way higher on this side than on the other side. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you got it done. Uh, it's uh, old news. Now, I was intrigued about you're going to have a meeting here and they're going to talk about your health insurance. Is that right? Federal employees and oh. oh, yeah. I don't know if it's on this side of the river, but where I am, they call up every 10 minutes. And they, they want you to, uh, uh, they say, are you in Medicare Part B? Yep. And I say, well, I've learned now. You answer, and if somebody doesn't speak right to you after you say hello, hang right up. Yep. Uh, they, they say it's all done by computers. they just mm -hmm. constantly probing, looking for people to, mm -hmm. to come to them. Well, it, I don't know. It, it seems like we go through waves of that stuff. For a while, they were calling me up wanting to know uh, wanted to sell me insurance policies for my funeral expenses. And uh, I said, geez, I'm not dead yet. I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> then before that, there was this, these people calling up and saying that they were from Microsoft Technical Support, that your computer has got to have work done on it. And I said, oh, I'm so glad you called. Could you hook me up first to Mr. Bill Gates? I want to talk to him. <laughs> and, uh, whoosh, they cut you right off. They don't want to talk to you. Anyways, so anyway, it's good to be here. Uh, I uh, I always start these talks. I'd go all over New Hampshire doing them, occasionally come over to the other side of the river, and once in a while I'd go down to Massachusetts or York County and Maine. But uh, I always ask people, have you ever heard of Merritt, New Hampshire? Nobody. Yeah. Well, it's in the town of Plainfield. I ask for a show of hands. How many ever heard of Plainfield, New Hampshire? Sometime, well, that's pretty good, about 50%. You know. <laughs> no, <Mary. laughs> no I was way over in Carroll County on the main border one night, and there was a big crowd of people, and one hand went up. And uh, I asked a fellow afterwards, I said, what, what town are you from? He said, Parsons Field, Maine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I always have to explain. Plainfield's over on the Connecticut River, and uh, the little thing is, Hanover, there's Lebanon, White River Junction, Plainfield, Cornish, Claremont. I said, oh, all right. How do you get there? And I said, just get on 89, you'll come right up to it. But uh, anyways, uh, so what I want to talk about tonight, if you invited me to come, is to talk about when electricity came to rural Upper Valley. Um, you know, electricity came first to places like Dewey's Mansion over there in Queechee when uh, they had a generator and, and generator. And this was in the early 1880s. And then there was uh, Miss Gates, that was a powerful force in, in the White River Junction area. She'd been to Boston and she saw how uh, it improved life to have illumination, to have electricity. And she said, White River Junction's got to have it. And uh, she, she got it going. And she c connected with uh, across the river with folks in West Lebanon, they, they, one of the early ways of generating power was to harness the Mascoma River in what I always call Butmanville, where all the shopping centers are right there, you where the river comes around. It used to be a power station there until recently. And uh, so, but they learned that water power around here is not as reliable as they wanted. So they went to steam and, uh, and that was the norm for, for a while until the, the grid got much more sophisticated, much more extended all over. And, uh, but when, uh, what I want to talk about is basically the period from World War I to the mid-1950s, when here in this region there were two civilizations existing side by side, those who had power and those who didn't. And those who didn't lived almost the same as they would have in the 1890s, all right? I just want to go over some of those highlights, how life was. Uh, where I grew up in Plainfield, uh, we were the last uh, house on the power when I was growing up, but from our place on up the road, they didn't have electricity, and so I got to see exactly what I'm talking about, how it was a hard, tough row for those folks compared with what their neighbors had if they had electricity. 
Um, so there's two cultures. I, I, I'm very firm on that. That's my brief. Uh, if you look at the numbers, say, in, in the 1930s, in rural New Hampshire, they did a lot of studies, extension service in the Grange, and they found that only 10% of those who lived in rural areas had electricity, 10% of the population. So it, it was a, 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 just an amazing um, decima uh, division, that's what I want to say. But without electricity, just think about what it was like. Mm -hmm. Wood heat. Everything was wood heat in those days. And uh, it was, wood was uh, uh, almost like currency. You know, you had a cord of wood, you could sell it immediately. You could barter it for a load of hay or a calf or whatever. Uh, but that was the way it was, and it involved huge amounts of labor. It soaked up a lot of available labor uh, just getting wood uh, so that it could be used for heat. You know, with wood, you got to cut it, you got to block it up, split it, trundle it in, stack it up, dry it, and then drug it in the house. Uh, heat around here and all over in New England uh, until the 1840s and 50s was fireplaces, basically. And you all know about fireplaces. You stand up close and you get scorched and go back 20 feet and freeze to death. Uh, they're pretty darn inefficient. Try, imagine trying to cook with a fireplace. Uh, I go down to the Deerfield Fair once in a while and they have a part of their colonial village or whatever you want to call it. They have some ladies there that are baking. Well, they do it at Tunbridge too. Baking bread with a fireplace. I mean, what, a, what an undertaking, my God. But that's the way it was. Box stove came along in the 1840s and began to make a huge impact. But then you get to 1881 when came the first true kitchen appliance, and that was the Glenwood stove. Now the Glenwood is sort of a, a brand name, but it's a generic term for a, a cook stove that served many functions. And they were made in Taunton, Mass, in a foundry down there, and they continued to make them all the way up to about 1954. And uh, they're wonderful devices. They have a firebox for, for the BTUs. You need an oven in the middle, and over on the right side, a reservoir where you can heat water. And then they'd have a shelf up a little higher where you could put a dish to keep it warm. And uh, that, that was a great breakthrough for people. And, uh, as time went on, <clears throat> when they began to get into, uh, in, in, yeah, inside plumbing, uh, they said, why don't we put a coil around that firebox and we'll heat some water that way rather than having to do it in that reservoir. And that became quite a fad as time went on. Uh, but with that, you had to have a reservoir tank, and it would often be over in the corner. Sometimes they were copper, a lot of them were galvanized. But you know, if somebody forgot and left a draft open, you could get that water in that tank boiling. It's amazing, and I remember it clearly about water. And what I never have understood is why, when that steam comes off that boiling water, it wants to track back through the cold water pipe. So you go over to the sink, and you turn on the faucet for cold water, you get a jet of steam, all right? I was in the Army in Fort Jackson, South Carolina in 1962, and we were in World War II barracks, and they were heated with soft coal, big old hot air furnace, and then there was a little boiler unit there, also fueled with soft coal, and a reserve tank. And uh, of course that uh, stuff had been sitting there for many years, uh, way beyond its expected life uh, cycle, and the valves, the safety valves, were all corroded. But they were just a bunch of soldiers, and all of us were too bright. We didn't forget and, uh, if we were tending the fire and leave a draft open and get the water in that reserve tank boiling, just like back home. So in the bathrooms, it was always on the walls, painted up. Stand up before flushing. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, that's the way it was. The Glenwood, you know, I'm very interested about the Glenwood. Now there's a fad of people uh, paying big money for, uh, for nice Glenwood stoves. I got a next door neighbor over in Meriden. 
He goes around junkyards all over and finds old Glenwood stoves and brings them home and he rehabs the things. And he's found a foundry in Michigan that will cast pieces for for repair uh, projects. And uh, he can get up to $8,000 for a nice one that's nice and black with brilliant chrome trim. And uh, a lot of these people take them and they decorate these high-end houses. You know, they don't even cook on them or anything. They just use them for like a table over one side. Who knew? You know, it's amazing. Uh, anyway, you all know about wood heat, smoke, ashes, chimney fires, uh, all of that accompanied the uh, the use of the heating with wood. Uh, water, huge challenge, constantly. You got to have water. Uh, if you were lucky, you might have a spring up on the hillside and you had gravity. The greatest, farmer's great, best friend has always been gravity. And if you had gravity feed from up on the hill, you were very, very lucky. But not many people did. And so that meant they had to fetch water. You had to go get it. You might have a well outside. Or if you didn't have that, you might have to go to a brook and get water. Well, guess who that chore fell on? Women. Women loved, they did not love, they had to lug water into the house. It was a daily chore, an incredible burden, really. Um, you go outside to drop a bucket on a rope down into a well, crank it back up, lug it on in uh, all year round. An awful chore. Um, <clears throat> had to have it for cooking, for house cleaning, bathing. Uh, gave rise to the sponge bath. They heat up some water on the stove, put it in a wash tub, stand in it, and clean yourself off with a sponge. And of course, that gave rise to the famous saying, I only take a bath on Saturday night whether I need it or not. Uh, you know, all right. Uh, laundry, toil, washboards, water had to be heated, of course, and uh, a huge chore of uh, washing, imagine filthy overalls, undergarments, sheets, everything, all done in a wash tub with a washboard, and you scrubbed and scrubbed, and that was an enormous chore, and boy, that was a thing. As I was doing a research on this and studying it out, one of the things that came across was very, very interesting, that uh, at the turn of the 20th century in, in rural New England, the infant mortality rate uh, was around 25%. In other words, about 25% of new baby would die before reaching age of two, all right? Well, the uh, University of New Hampshire Extension Service and uh, UVM, others all said, hey, wait a minute, we can address some of that. They began to go around to rural areas and get young mothers together and say, look, boil your diapers. A stop strap and staff, which was killing these babies, had a dramatic effect right off on helping keep babies healthy and alive. Uh, so anyways, um, all of that, uh, it's just amazing what people went through dealing with a need for water and the labor that it was uh, that surrounded all that. Uh, then, of course, you all know about a back house or an outhouse, a privy, whatever you want to call it. That was an essential piece. Had to have them. Lighting. Life was oriented around the availability of light. And uh, this time of year, of course, uh, it was a pretty short day and a long night. Uh, they used candles made from animal fat. Later on, petroleum, uh, kerosene for uh, cleaning for lamps, and that was another chore that fell on women very, very heavily. It was cleaning lamps to make them be, uh, so they do the job. They would have glass globes on them. They would get blacked up if things weren't quite right. They had to trim the wicks and all that. And then they had to bring in the kerosene to put it in the little reservoir underneath. And kerosene is a kind of stuff, if you spill a drop in your house, your house will smell like an oil refinery for two or three days. So that was a, a, always a challenge, amazing. And uh, they used to, there was another saying that came out at oh, that time, uh, we like to go to bed when it's dark under the table. They didn't want to have to fuss or darn kerosene lamps, they'd just go to bed and get to sleep. And then refrigeration, which is really one of the most fascinating aspects of this time, how 
they used ice, ice cut on ponds or out of, uh, out of rivers sometimes. But it was a big industry, ice was huge in, in New Hampshire and this part of Vermont. Uh, and a lot of ice was cut on ponds and uh, 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 eventually shipped to Boston and loaded on boats and it was taken to the south and even into the Caribbean. And uh, it was a huge industry and employed many, many people. Uh, I, uh, they didn't do it this past winter because the ice wasn't thick enough, but over on Keezer Lake, just south of New London, Sutton, they, uh, in January, always have an ice cutting. They do it the old-fashioned way. They have people out there and they grid off the ice surface and they take these saws and they cut the blocks and they got teams of horses there and they hook them uh, the blocks and pull them up out and they take them up to the uh, Musterfield farm where they have an ice house and they pack out of ice in sawdust. And in August, they take some old blocks out and make ice cream. I mean, they're still doing it the old way, but they didn't do it this past year because the ice didn't get thick enough. And uh, so anyway, the industry of ice was huge uh, all through the time I'm talking about and uh, gave rise to the occupation of the ice man. Now, the ice man was often a kind of a cold word. Um, there might be uh, five uh, little brown-eyed, dark-haired kids uh, in a family, and then there's one blue-eyed, blonde kid, Iceman. The Iceman cometh, that was what they say. And then uh, everybody had, men, most people had an ice box. You simply would put a block of ice in a, a vertical chest and it would help keep stuff cool. It would gradually melt and drip down into a, a, a pan on the bottom and then it, every week the ice man would come with a block of ice, usually had it slung over his shoulder and he'd put it in there. And uh, that's how that worked. Uh, and then uh, one, uh, I, I mentioned one of the things of that time was icebox cookies. Anybody ever have icebox cookies? Yeah, all right, good. Yeah, I was uh, down in Antrim one night and I was talking about that. And I said, anybody ever do it? And the guy put his hand up, I'll make you some. And I said, yeah, right, sure. Well, a son of a gun, two weeks later, he came up to one of Smith's auctions and he brought ice, uh, two dozen icebox cookies for me. You know, it's all it is is just common dough, but it's put it's chilled down so they can slice it with a knife, make nice, neat uh, cookies. So they're very good, but we don't hear much about them anymore. Well, it was the same on the farm. In rural areas, getting the water for livestock was a huge task. Uh, animals got to be watered at least once every day. And uh, again, if you had gravity and you let the water flow down, Mm, boy, that was great. You have a water box in the barnyard, you lift the animals out, they go get a drink and then bring them back in. If it didn't have them, ho ho, you had to fetch water or you had to figure out some alternative. Oftentimes, they would chop a hole in ice in a pond, in a pond or in a brook and just let the animals go over and get their, get their water. And, um, you know, it was not very good. It was ice water. Cows would be ganted up, as they used to say. Uh, for hours afterwards while they're trying to warm that up in their, in their guts. Uh, <clears throat> of course, on the farm, everybody was milking by hand before electricity came. And uh, as time went on in the 19th century, when we began to get more, enough cows so that it wasn't just subsistence farming, uh, where milk was just produced for the needs of the family and maybe just the immediate neighborhood uh, and made into butter or cheese. Uh, came uh, right after Civil War, uh, all, all villages around here developed creameries. And what would happen would be the farmers would bring their warm milk to the neighborhood creamery in the morning and they'd put that milk in these big flat pans, look like sat pans or roasting pans. It was a process they call setting milk. And then about two o'clock in the afternoon, they'd go out and the cream would have risen on that milk and they'd skim it off. And then they'd leave it there overnight and then again, there'd be some cream on the top and they'd skim it off. And that's where the term skim milk comes from. 
and they would, um, after they had done that, farmers would take uh, that skim milk home, feed it to pigs or calves or whatever. And that's the way it was organized, really. But it began to change as early as 1846, but widespread by the 1890s. And that was because, well, taking the lead was a guy named H.P. Hood. Uh, he was from uh, uh, Derry, New Hampshire. And he said, this is all crazy the way they're doing it. Why not get all that milk and organize it, put it on the trains? The trains were coming. Trains came to Hoyt River in 1847 and begin to put it on a train, bring it to Boston, and we'll industrialize the whole process down there. And later on, of course, came the cream separator and a lot of advances as time went on. And so that gave rise to a whole new system of, of uh, uh, handling and, and getting milk in, uh, to the consumers. And uh, at one point, it was, uh, around 1900, they, well, they always had milk trains. Milk was in, in, uh, in metal cans at the farm, chilled in ice water or whatever they had, taken to a railroad uh, point and loaded on a car and taken to Boston. At one point between White River and Concord, uh, there were as many as 50 different stops where the milk trains would stop and pick up milk load it on, and then uh, when they came back, drop off the empty containers. <clears throat> well, it's, it's not that different today, except it's tractor trailers rolling down Interstate 89, from, particularly from northern Vermont. That's the way it's all changed. Everything on the farm, hand labor, uh, fork and manure, uh, feed, everything was done by hand. Chores, if they tried to do them in daylight, because kerosene lamps and barns don't agree. Uh, more farms had fires because of kerosene lamp probably than anything else. Well, it was like this all over the United States, everywhere, everywhere. And in 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was running for president, and one of his main planks in his platform was, let's get rural America electrified. Uh, how we're going to do it, we don't quite know initially, but we want to do it. Hoover, his predecessor, had recognized that w things were being held back by the absence of electric service uh, in the rural areas. But Roosevelt said, we're going to go ahead with this and get it moving. He signed an executive order in 1935. He established the uh, Rural Electrification Administration. And there was a lot of opposition to that from the uh, private utilities. Uh, they, they, they thought it was unnecessary. But they, hadn't, they didn't give a damn about running electricity out in rural areas because there weren't enough customers to make any real money. Uh, so uh, Congress followed along 1936 Rural Electrification Act. Now, this brought money into rural areas to, to get this project going to wire up rural America. Now, the very important thing about the REA was this. It was not grants, it was loans, all right? They would loan money to entities in the individual states or even in counties to do, to do this work, but it had to be paid back, all right? So that's a critical distinction. And uh, uh, <clears throat> initially, of course, there was a lot of political opposition, a lot of noise uh, from um, the, the private utilities. They, they didn't want this to happen, but they were still uninterested in taking care of rural areas. So rural groups would form all over the United States to, to go to work and get some of this IREA loan money in and build the infrastructure to provide electricity for all the rural areas. In New Hampshire, it was the Grange. The Grange got it going. In Vermont, there were several uh, small entities, cooperatives formed that uh, did it. Not right around here on the Vermont side. It was mostly up in um, Lamoille County, North uh, Washington County, up in that country, all the way to the Canadian border. Uh, the Grange in New Hampshire got a uh, REA representative come up from Washington, give them a pep talk, and uh, they said uh, he was. He told them, "You've got to form some sort of a cooperative to get this done, to be a vehicle to do this." And they did. They went to work and got the charter and everything, 
and formed what is now the New Hampshire Electric Co-op. It's still in existence. And uh, to, to meet the loan requirements under REA, and that was the same for those co-ops up in northern and north central Vermont. It was the same. They had to be able to get three members per mile to sign up. And to sign up, you had to buy a, one share of stock at $5, all right? A lot of people in the Depression, they didn't have the $5. So they took IOUs, and REA said, okay, that's good enough. Uh, $5 is a hell of a lot of money at that time. The biggest challenge, though, in all of this was skepticism among the people in rural areas. A lot of people said, hey, I milk my cows. I'm all right, no problem. I cut ice in the pond, chill the milk. I don't need electricity. It's kind of scary and dangerous. I don't, I don't care. Mama, she fetches water. She does a good job with it. She cleans the lamps, all that. Uh, this is just not a great idea. But the advocates said, aha, well, we can address this. Very simple. They made sure the women folk were at the table when they came to make the pitch, all right? And they say to Mama, wouldn't it be nice to be able to just turn a knob on a range and be able to heat up supper. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to have a refrigerator where you could steep, keep stuff cold and you didn't have to worry about all the slop and hassle of an icebox, all of that? Aha, now there, you're talking. And so that's what sold the deal for an awful lot of people uh, under the IRA regime. Well, same thing was happening in, in Vermont, only in this case it was investor-owned utilities began to step up. There was a lot of pressure from George D. Aiken. He was governor in the 1930s. Uh, he, he just said, let's get it going. Come on, you guys, you gotta do it. Most of his focus actually was on who would generate the power that they needed in the rural areas. So, well, the whole state needed. And he had been around during all those terrible floods of 37, uh, 27 and 36, and there was a big push on uh, from the federal government to build flood control structures. And uh, oh, these were going to be good resources for generating power. You know, Heartland, Union, Village, and Springfield, various locations. And Aiken and, and Roosevelt fought over this. He wanted the, uh, uh, Aiken uh, was afraid that the private utilities would get control of them and jack up the value of the, of the uh, power. It, it seesawed back and forth, but uh, eventually um, the focus on getting the wires to the rural areas uh, remained top of the, of the list, and uh, they stayed with it, such that by the last town in Vermont to get electricity, was up in Victory, up in the Northeast Kingdom. That came in 1956. Uh, in New Hampshire, it was Hart's location, way up in the White Mountains. It was 1968. So this took quite a while, but the dramatic part of it was accomplished in the period from 1939 to about 1952 on both sides of the river. Uh, and it's pretty dramatic. When you think about it, it was hard to get the labor because of the war and a lot of people were leaving the countryside to go work in the shops. You know, a lot of people went to work at Cone Automatic or uh, Sullivan Machine, Goodyear, over here, whatever, and to get labor to, to do this work on these power lines was a big challenge. Uh, the, uh, the meeting those requirements, <laughs> that was a challenge. Well, uh, I, have to, I have to read for you. Uh, a couple of little uh, reminiscences about when power came. In New Hampshire, the first uh, REA power went online in December of 1939 because they had set the first pole on the Village Green in Lempster, down below Newport. You can go down there now, there's a historical marker that tells about that first pole being set there. Lempster had no power whatsoever at that point. And the whole town turned out first week in December to celebrate that first pole going up. And just in a matter of a few months, they had it hooked up to a substation of the public service company up in Sunapee, and they flipped the switch. And there were, let's see, oh, 40, you know, 45 miles of power line 
uh, were activated and uh, dozens, well, actually several hundred farms and rural residences were, uh, were empowered. Uh, uh, the coming of electric power was cause for an enormous celebration. Uh, I love these, uh, these uh, are culls from the histories. Number one was a woman would later recall, she said, when the power came on, we danced and screamed and ran all over the house, pulling on all the lights. Then we dashed outside to see what the house looked like, all illuminated. All right. There was an elderly woman. She doubted she'd ever see her home powered by what she called artificial light. Uh, she moved her rocking chair right under her new ceiling fixture and said she was going to sit right there and rock all night and look at that light. <laughs> oh, that's cute. And then the guy, he was the commissioner of agriculture, his name was Andrew Felker. And he was from over in Meredith, his prominent farmer. But uh, he came home from work uh, in Concord uh, the afternoon before Christmas, Christmas, and his house, they had just finished wiring it up and hooking it up to the power line. And he found a, a, a toaster under the Christmas tree. It was, he just couldn't believe it. He was so excited that he sat down under the glow of his new electric light and he wrote a 25 stanza poem which concluded with this verse. He said, yes, now I am happy because we have lights and I don't care a hoot about going out nights. I love to stay home with my blessed wife, and although 70, I have the time of my life. <laughs> so that was, that's a reminiscence from late 1940. Uh, <laughs> it's cute. Um, anyways, um, I can't under uh, um, emphasize the effect of World War II on getting materials, getting labor, to get this all done, but by golly, they did get it. They were counting on a lot more of a, of a volume of electricity being sold, in other words, a higher load, but it was held back by wartime rationing, where it was hard for people to get electric ranges and washing machines and all that stuff that was going to use a lot of power. But they persevered and they got through and, and made it happen. Um, well, what was happening right here in our area was happening all over the United States. The most dramatic impacts that this had Number one, it raised agricultural productivity at a time when America desperately needed more food because as World War II was beginning to wind down, it was clear that there were millions and millions of people in Europe that were starving and were going to need to be fed. So this, this surge of, of productivity played uh, an important role in getting food to those folks in Europe and getting them fed. Uh, and it also began to have quite an effect on improving the lifespans and the health of uh, people who lived in rural areas. I mean, just think about it. If, if women don't have to go out in the cold every two or three times a day and fetch water, hard work, you know, 30, 40 pound load of water walking in the house day after day, uh, that's going to wear you down and, and have a profound impact. That went away. Amazing. Heating changed. Uh, you know, we went through wood and then coal came along. People were hot for coal. Uh, yeah, right. Pun. Uh, the um, electricity enabled uh, the, uh, the uh, well, using thermostats, uh, which work well with coal. You know, to have an electric thing over on the wall and you could turn it up and down and it would tell the furnace open the draft or close it down as you went on. And then later, of course, came oil and then came propane. And of course, now everybody's all fired up about uh, heat pumps. Boy, are we ever get hearing about heat pumps everywhere we look. Uh, water, we got uh, with electricity, you could have a water pump. And that uh, brought indoor plumbing flush toilets, bathtubs, kitchens, I had water. That was, that was very, very uh, revolutionary. It was, had tremendous impact. Uh, of course, the privies went away, and they're now relics. Uh, lighting um, changed lifestyles, home life. Electric stoves got, uh, took over from the Glenwoods. Um, 
amazing. And then refrigeration, which is really to me the most interesting part. Um, you think about having a refrigerator enable you to have ice cream. Um, you could have uh, uh, frozen foods. Uh, frozen foods came on like gangbusters after World War II and helped you know, um, because of uh, in rural areas people said, aha, we can take some of the products we grow, we freeze it, all of that. Cold beverages, fresh produce, uh, food safety went way up when leftovers were refrigerated properly. Uh, bacteria growth was uh, retarded, uh, you know, had that effect. On the farm, milking machines took over, run by electricity, and then, of course, electric milk coolers. They were basically chests with water in them, a refrigeration unit on the top, and an agitator kind of pumped that water around and put the cans of milk down in, chill the milk fast. And they were very, very popular on many, many farms for this reason. You could put bottles of beer in them and get them nice and cold, and the women folk had no idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and uh, and then of course uh, with milking machines, milk coolers, gutter cleaners, ventilation uh, enabled uh, uh, fruit storage, uh, adequate refrigeration, all of these things it, uh, improved the uh, well. The work day changed dramatically, cuts down on barn fires, and having regular supply of water, source of water available all around was great for animal welfare. You know, the animals um, were thirsty, they could get a drink. It was, it was wonderful. My neighbors right up the road on Freeman Road in Plainfield, the Nelsons, they did not have power, but they farmed. They milked a bunch of cows. and. Uh, uh, in my childhood, uh, early 1940s, they, uh, they milked the cows and chilled the milk with electricity, but not the house. Uh, the power came from what they called a Delco. It was just a generator, sat out in the woodshed, and you could fire that thing up just by flipping a switch on the wall and the thing would run. But the only time they'd run that thing was when they were milking and they wanted to get the milk cold. Then they shot it off, came in, had supper, and it was starting to get dark. Hmm, that's the way it is. That's the way we're going to do it. And uh, But the Nelson kids were all about the same age as my brother and sister and I. And those kids would come down to our place. They did just like I was telling about there early. Run around and turn on the lights and look at that. And they go in the next one, turn on the lights, you know. This was a big deal. They, they, they just, they couldn't get enough of it. Amazing. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the, the co-op in New Hampshire had some troubles. They had a big embezzlement at one point. Uh, they uh, got a new president who was a visionary in uh, early 1950, and he said, okay, this co-op is not just for farms anymore. Uh, it's for... Uh, second homes and, and non-farm residences, all of that. And he, you know, he stood by as, you know, tremendous change took place and the co-op uh, grew and expanded. It's now a presence in 75 towns and has way over 100,000 customers. Um, it's also, the interesting thing about it is that it's not a regulated utility. Uh, when you get power from the co-op, you are one of the owners of the company, and if you've got a problem about your bill, you take it up with your board of directors. You can't go to Concord and get any help. Now, it's the same for the co-ops up in northern Vermont. Uh, the biggest challenge is reliability. Now, bear in mind, <laughs> in 1939, 1940, they were setting these lines and want to go up to those farms up on top of that hill. Well, there's quite a long ways to go down here and go up that road. Why don't we just go right across the pasture? Farmers would say they were so anxious to get it. They said, sure, go to it. Well, set those lines right up across. Well, those pastures are all trees now. And so that's a challenge. And that's the, the, the New Hampshire Co-op, that's their biggest challenge is reliability. Uh, there's a saying, it's not really fair, but a lot of people say, when the wind blows, the co-op goes. All right, so a lot of people have gotten those little generator units and so on. But between Plainfield and Cornish, the co-op has six miles of lines that are not accessible by bucket truck. 
they got to have a track vehicle to get to uh, uh, to fix a, a tree on the line or whatever. They do they do pretty well. They're doing a lot better now than they used to. Uh, we in Plainfield we have three different utilities. We got used to be Central Vermont Public Service on the west part, and then it became uh, I don't know what it was, but it, now it's EverSource. And in the middle is the co-op, and on the east part is Liberty. It used to be Granite State Electric. Anyway, that's the way it is. So uh, now uh, the thing I want to talk about to wrap it up is this, that we have kind of a similar situation today, and it's to do with this business with broadband. You know, that is so important to the economy of, of rural New Hampshire and Vermont. And there's a lot of effort being expended to try to improve the access to broadband. In other words, to get people hooked up onto the internet uh, with reliable high-speed service. And it's almost the same as it was back before electric came. If you don't have good uh, broadband, you're behind. And that business at COVID, where they shut down the schools, there are an awful lot of kids that got left behind. They missed out on a year and a half, almost two years of school. I have a neighbor that teaches at Lebanon High School. She said, I can spot those kids. You know, they didn't get any education for two years because they, where they were, they didn't have broadband. They didn't have a computer, maybe, to, uh, to do these online uh, courses. Uh, and uh, we, we COVID also emphasized, well, really put, shone a light on it, that an awful lot of people are working from home now and they need that access. Uh, I'm sure it's the same here in Hartford and uh, in the neighborhood over here on Vermont side, but I've got, I've got some neighbors. They're lawyers or some law firm in Washington, D.C., and they do everything online. You know, they do all their briefs and all that and send them down, they communicate back and forth, and they sit in Merritt, New Hampshire doing it. Uh, and that's because where they happen to be, they're right next to a fiber optic and high-speed, reliable uh, internet connection. So anyway, so the challenge goes on. Uh, millions of dollars are being expended to try to get this problem solved. Um, anyway, uh, I think I've talked long enough, yeah. Am I okay with a microphone? Okay, she said it worked out good. So I don't know, anybody have something to like bring up in the discussion? Yes. Steve, if I remember right, I heard that in, back when electricity was first coming out to the hinterlands, that some people were just afraid of it because yeah. they didn't understand, they thought it was throughout the house? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was true, and that was one of the things they ran into around in this area. But something that happened down in Charlestown, there was a short circuit. It wasn't on IREA power, it was on a private utility. It had something went wrong, and electricity went into a barn and killed a whole herd of cows. And that scared a lot of people. A lot of people said, woo, I don't want that near me, if that's what can happen. I mean, that was, that was one of the things, just like you say, it was a big concern. Yeah, yeah. I have a favorite book written by a guy who grew up in Flushing, Michigan, near Flint, sure. before World War I. Yeah. And he said that the, the local power station, which was built on the river, yeah. expanded out to the farmers in the uh, outlying areas. Right. And Edison was backordered on light bulbs, yeah. and several of the farmers jammed corn cobs into the uh, <laughs> sockets because they were afraid the juice was going to run out. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I'm, uh, people say, well, how, how do these houses get wired up? Well, uh, by 1939, it was almost gone by, but it was that knob and tube. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen it. I mean, that was through the early part of the 20th century. That was the way it was done. There used to be a wonderful hardware store down here in, in White River, Lang Hardware. Some of you remember? You could go in there in the 1950s and buy knob and tube stuff. And uh, my wife and I, we were going to make a lot of money. We were big shots. And we bought this old junky house in Meriden, and we fixed it up, and we're going to rent it. Well, we stood on the threshold looking in. You could see 
if anybody walked on that floor, it moved up and down like that. It was supported by the knob and tube wiring underneath. Uh, gee, I, uh, we learned we weren't cut out to be landlords. Yes. Yes, I, I also, my house was, was, was electrified early on because yep. it's on one of the main, main roads heading yep. north and south. And you can tell it's early because I still have all the pull cords. Yep. Like, I have very few rooms that have light switches. Yep. And I've also been in another old house that has the, the old push, you know, the, you know, instead of a switch, you push. Yep. Little knobs to yes. turn them off. And oh, on. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's another, let's put it, that's in downtown White River. So yeah. it's also an early house. So yeah. It's yeah. kind of funny when you see the places that have the pull cords. I'm like, well, oh, that's <laughs> early wiring. Yeah. And that one probably still has. Yeah. yeah. And the earliest, the old fuse boxes where oh, you, yes. you yes. turn in these little cartridge yeah. things, you put them in there and they keep blowing and they put a penny in there and then screw it down and just, you know, bypass the, the whole thing. Oh yeah, incredible. Anybody else? Uh, okay, yes sir. Well, I, we uh, looked at a house to buy uh, quite a few years ago that where the electric service came in originally, it was just a, a bleed where the service entrance was. Yep. There was a like a handle with a it's all exposed terminals. A knife switch. Nice yeah. Switch. A knife switch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I can't imagine how many people just accidentally touched or Ooh. You know, there was no there was no guards around. No guards around. Yeah. This wasn't working then, but the switch was still there. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. So, yeah. Steve, George's grandfather talks about one of the, the it, it took a while to get electricity out to our farm mm -hmm. because the neighbor just down below refused to get it. Uh, and so they wouldn't run yep, the electricity yep. unless he got it first to come sure. up. Sure. So they ended up having to come from Runnels Road and come up that I way. I see. Wow. Yeah. That was probably a mile across yep. pastures. <clears throat> yeah. Just yep. recently they disconnected it. We brought it our power in the other way. In the other way. Because they couldn't drive to a, a I house. see. Sure. And by that time the trees are towering over these yes. you know, twenty yeah. foot poles. Yeah. And uh, they had outages and Amazing. They disconnected it. Yeah. Yeah. If, as long as you don't mind hearing some more stories. But uh, I, I lived, you know, without electricity for almost two years and lived by a kerosene lamp and all um, when I was in the Peace Corps. And when my, my, I lived on a, a fenced in a compound uh, where the, my school was, because I was teaching school in Botswana. And when we finally got a generator at the school, we had electricity until eight o'clock at night. And my fellow teachers, um, there was, at that time I think, I was the only one not from Botswana. But the other teachers, they'd all gone to teacher's college and they lived in a big area with electricity all the time, you know, you know that kind of thing. Cause, but all the rural villages, like where our school was, nobody had electricity. Mm -hmm. You know, and none of these teachers had electricity when they were children, only when they went to college. So when the electricity got turned on at the school, it was like you were describing. They were so excited to have their mm -hmm. house electrified, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they could get a refrigerator mm -hmm. and all this, you know. But the kids at the school, they were, you know, 14 to 21. None of them had ever experienced electricity. This mm -hmm. was, you know, so they they wanted to flip the switch on in the classroom. And so I just, for the first couple of weeks, it's like, whatever, you know, because it was brand new to them. And it was so exciting to have lights in their classroom. But yeah, that same, you know, the idea it was just the novelty of it. But the excitement for having it in your house oh, was a big thing for the teachers. Yes, they yes. were so, yeah. so happy. And think of making supper, going to fry up some hot dogs or beans or whatever, and we don't have to build a fire to do it. You know, you can just turn a knob and, and you're in business. You yeah. know, just think of it. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, well, okay, folks, thanks an awful lot for listening. It was great. Yep.